please welcome product manager at Slack, Paige Kehoe. Hello. Hi, Spec. Uh, welcome to my session. Today we're going to be talking about app interactivity. And um, I think I'm the last thing that stands before us in the ending keynote. So let's dive into it. Before going into talking about app interactivity, let's take a step back and recap some of the things that we heard today from Ellie and team about the Slack app toolkit. Today we talked about the happy path for building apps. And there are four key components that that entails. First, permissions. We launched today granular bot permissions, which allows you to request only the scopes that you need to build your app. This allows our largest and most secure enterprises to harness the value of platform. Next, we talked about Blockkit. This is our UI framework that we launched in February, which hopefully you already know and love. And today we talked about how we have multi-selects and radio buttons coming to Blockkit. Next, we have surfaces. We announced two new surface areas in Slack. That's Blockkit and Modals and Blockkit and App Home. These enable you to build richer end-to-end -end app experiences. And lastly, we announced actions. These are simple shortcuts for users to trigger and complete a task in Slack from anywhere. If you're familiar with message actions, this is similar functionality in more places. But what you're all really here to talk about is surfaces. So we're going to go through these surface areas and what it means for your apps and how you can best leverage them to make awesome app experiences. If you're curious about learning more about BlockKit and the components that we use to build those, our designer, Katie, is giving a talk tomorrow on that. I know I'll be there. So with these new surfaces and blocks, we've opened up a whole new realm of options and possibilities for your apps. We're going to go through a couple of the best practices for that and guiding principles of where we're thinking that you can use these surface areas. Then we'll hear from some of our partners who've actually done this already. And of course, I wouldn't be a product manager if I didn't talk about the future roadmap for BlockKit as well. First, we'll talk about best practices for app experiences. We want you to build intuitive app experiences. That means designing with your users in mind, optimizing for each surface area, and creating a cohesive app experience. We're going to go through a couple examples of each of these. This one might sound pretty obvious, but it's easy to forget when you're going through all of our API side and looking at all the announcements and reading some awesome articles. You need to remember that the number one priority is the user. So let's bring them along in this journey, because this is also something that's brand new for them. They're not stuck going to the app DM space and saying, help. They actually will have a space that you build for them to understand how to use your app. So let's surface the proper controls, provide guidance, and predictability for them as well. First, we recommend settings. Settings and preferences are one of our key requests from our users. We've heard that one of the top reasons for people uninstalling apps is because they don't understand how to configure their notifications. So get ahead of that. Surface the notification preferences or the subscription preferences for your app in a modal or in the app home. Here we have an example from Streak, which is one of our Modal's partners. They're a CRM platform for Gmail. If your sales team is doing their job, your CRM is probably pretty active, and there's a lot of things going on there. Not every user wants to hear about all of that. So get ahead of that and surface all the granularity of notifications that you can have and let the user be in control. Other things that work well in a settings Modal are authorization. For instance, if you need to configure a third party app to make configuration with Slack, like G Drive, you can have an authorization modal that says, hey, hop into Google Drive to authenticate your app. Next, we recommend proactively communicating everything that's going to be happening to the user. We've heard, I even heard from some people today, that the users don't always know what's going to happen when they click buttons or when they're looking at a link or when they're going through modals. So make sure that you're getting ahead of that and communicating to the user if they're saving their information or if their information isn't going to be saved. 
we give you one of these for free. This is the speed bump. If you've typed information into modal and tried to exit a modal before, you've probably seen this. It says, your work's not going to be saved. Do you want to exit? This one you get for free, but you can take it one step further with the confirm object. This is an object that exists on all interactive components in BlockKit. You can define the message and the buttons, giving the user a warning that whatever they just did is going to trigger an action. Especially if you're going to be triggering something in a third-party service, make sure you're letting the user know that when they click that dropdown, something else is happening outside of Slack. So putting that in context, say you have a JIRA ticket, and you want to change the project it's connected to. If changing that dropdown in Slack is going to change it in your actual JIRA, make sure that you're using the confirm object to tell the user that that's going to happen. And now with modals, you can even take this further. We recommend having a confirmation modal or a last step in your workflow. And you can do that with multi-step modals or dynamic update. So this means you confirm what the user just did, or you confirm all the information that the user has put into that modal. This is an example of a survey. For instance, say you were completing a survey, you've put in all the answers to your questions, and you get to this last step. It tells you your survey has been sent. If you're sending information to other channels or other DMs as well, make sure that you surface that to the user. Because now, if you're in an app home, you might not be in that channel where your message is sent, and you wouldn't know that you just triggered a message somewhere else. Another example is think about when you're booking a flight. That last page before you get charged, you see here's the airport, here's the destination, here's how much it's going to be, here's the date. How many of you have gotten to that page and realized, wow, this is the wrong day, or this is the wrong airport entirely, or this is a different San Jose? I know I have. <laughs> Think about having a confirmation screen for the user as well, so they can go see all the information they've put in before you send it somewhere else. And with multi-step modals, you can go back and forth and keep editing that information so the user can finally make sure they're doing it right. The last thing we recommend is having a clear onboarding flow. We implemented this in Google Calendar with a response to the App Home Open Dement. When we did that, we saw a seven times increase in active users in just one week after implementing. Take advantage of that and provide onboarding for your users. Let them know how your app works, what it can do, where to find help. Here's an example from Workday where they tell you, hey, welcome to Workday. You can take time off here. You could take lots of time off. You could also look up a coworker, and there's a couple other options as well. We have an entire session dedicated to this tomorrow downstairs in the build track. So please check that out if you want to learn more. OK, so we went through a couple best practices considering the user. Let's put those into context with each, with each of the surface areas available to you. First, we have messages. This is our OG surface area, the place that BlockKit was born. App messages are sometimes also noisy. So remember that when you're sending a message to the user, you're drawing their attention. So now that you have other surface areas available to you, we recommend you use messages for real-time updates, time-sensitive notifications, and multi-person collaboration from an app to a channel. If you aren't going to be using messages for your app, you can actually even opt out of those with granular bot scopes. So you could have an app home only app space. So think of the example of tasks. So if we have this tasks app, it could be any sort of app like Jira, Trello, Asana. You've got a lot of tasks. There's a lot of functionality that you'd want for that. The things that belong in the context of messages now are things that require action immediately, like a task has been assigned to you, a task is coming late, or someone else has changed a task or edited a task that you owned. For the rest of that, in things that you would want to do with a task app, like viewing your list of tasks or seeing all the tasks you've created before, that would make sense in the app home tab. The Home tab is the default place for a user to learn about what they can do with your app and to actually use it. The goal for this surface area is for you to have a dynamic one-on-one -on -one experience between the user and the app, so it's very custom for each of your users. This can be a browsing experience. This can also be your app onboarding experience. And it can also be where the user sees how to find settings. Content that belong here is something like a list of tasks. And then you'd be able to sort on those 
with a drop down and say, OK, I want to see the tasks that are overdue, the tasks that are coming up, tasks that are next week. And if you wanted to create a new task, you would click that button and see a modal. We GA'd modals last month, and we announced it today. We're seeing tons of migration for dynamic workflows and multi-step workflows into modals. Another recommendation we have is if you're using a lot of ephemeral messages with your users, and you have a whole back and forth that goes between you and the user, consider moving that into the modal. Because modals also have an area for structured text input, and they can do user validation. Some examples of things that we've seen in modals are booking workflows, surveys, editing forms, settings, logging information, or creating a new task. So we've gone through designing with your users in mind. We've talked about optimizing for the surface areas that are now available. And now let's talk about creating one cohesive app experience. So here's our task app. We have our home. This is the place that I know I can always go and see everything that's up to date and relevant to me. I know I can just click tasks in the sidebar, and I can see here's my list of tasks. I can mark them complete. I can edit them. I can sort them. I can see information about them. And if I want to make a new one, it opens up in a modal. And that workflow, I start there. So I'm creating a new task. For instance, hey, team, let's build a new Slack app with App Home. And I type in the message. I say who I think it's important to send this to and assign it to my team. When I'm finished, I see that updated App Home in real time. Now I've got three tasks. And also, because I've assigned it to my team and I need them to know about it, I told it to send it to the channel as well. So the app says, hey, channel, we've got a new task. We're going to build a new app. So there you have it. That's a completed app experience in Slack, using all of the surface areas coming together for that seamless advanced workflows in Slack. And now that we've gone through those practices, we can hear from some people who've already done this. So we're going to hear from some of our Modals partners who've just launched their Modals apps. First, I'm going to bring on Aleem. He's a co-founder of Streak, a CRM for Gmail. Come on out, Aleem. Um, hi, my name is Aleem. Um, I'm the founder of a company called Streak. Um, so Streak is a CRM that's uh, built into Gmail. Our primary customers are small and medium-sized businesses, um, and we help them do their business pipelines, so things like sales, hiring, fundraising, deal flow, customer support. We help them do all of those things inside of Gmail. Um, our app is very deeply integrated into Gmail, and we'll talk a little bit about that going forward. But the primary purpose of Streak is to make people, is to help people push these pipelines forward. You know, get deals from a lead to closed, um, and and being deeply integrated Gmail is um, one of our primary differentiators. Um, and with Slack. Things are changing a little bit because um, people are very um, working a lot inside of Gmail when talking to customers, but when they're talking with their team, it's it's a lot of time in Slack. And so we've had we've we've built a a Slack app, and I want to show you some of that um, uh, right now. Um, this is just a quick quick illustration of what I mean by deeply integrated into Gmail. So exactly in the same places where um, customers do their work by talking to their customers. Um, they do that mostly inside of Gmail. And, um, and so when we say deeply integrated, we mean our entire UI built into Gmail. Uh, but again, like I said before, that's changing. Um, you may have a situation where you have uh, a team talking about a particular lead inside of Slack. Um, and so we built a Slack app that uses the Modals API um, to let you search for leads, uh, bring up details about them, it has a high level of interactivity, um, and the, the, really, the really killer part is that it feels like a full-blown application inside of Slack. It's not just like a message being popped in. Um, and I'll show you more with details of that. Um, another key use case uh, that we wanted to support was sending notifications from Streak into Slack. So when a deal closes, the team probably should know about that. When a new call happened, the team should probably know about that. And every team's sales process or hiring process is a little different. So we use the Modals API to let people configure exactly what notifications uh, they wanted to see. Uh, and so the Modals API has been really good for that because it allows for very rich UIs, really detailed UIs. Um, and so they can configure exactly how they want their, their notifications. Um, and the last thing I wanted to show you um, was um, something that, 
that we allow customers to send content from Slack back into Streak. And so if you're discussing something with your team, like, hey, what's the next step with this particular customer, you might want to log that as a task inside of, inside of Streak. Um, and the, I think the interesting part here is that when, when you tell us you want to send it to Streak, we ask you what it is. Is it a task? Is it a comment? Is it something else? Um, and depending on what you say and uh, what, how you answer that question, and, and that's that first drop down that you see on the screen, um, the UI dynamically changes. Um, so in this case, uh, the, the, the user said it's a task, and so now we show a due date field. But if they said it was a comment or something, we wouldn't, we wouldn't show that field. So it allows for this sort of rich, dynamic um, UI. So we're really excited about the Models API. Um, we launched our Slack app today, so um, that's really exciting. Um, and if you're looking for a CRM for Gmail, definitely check out Streak. Um, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So next, we're going to bring on the state. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> Clap. It's exciting. Next, we'll welcome Clayton from Qualtrics, an experience management platform. Great. Thanks, Paige. Great to be here. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Qualtrics, but we're a rapidly growing company um, out of Provo, Utah, and we are all about experience management. Um, experience management is what we believe to be the next big category in the enterprise SaaS space. The experience economy is changing the way that companies compete with each other. Businesses need to listen to the emotions, the intents, the um, beliefs of all of their customers, employees, partners, suppliers. And this type of data is called experience data, or X data. And businesses need to take this X data, analyze it, and understand its relationship with operational data, or O data. And to thrive in this experience economy, uh, companies need to build systems of action that intelligently use this X data and this O data to manage the four core experiences of a company. And these four experiences are the customer experience, the employee experience, the brand experience, and the product experience. And at Qualtrics, and the experience management platform, or the XM platform that we provide, uh, enable companies to do just that. So what are the components of the XM platform? Well, first, we have a powerful survey editor. This allows you to build questionnaires really easily, um, from simple surveys to doing professional market research. Data analysis and reporting. Uh, this includes um, topic and sentiment analysis, uh, role-based dashboards, or customized reports. And of course, uh, data is useless unless you act on it. So um, we have tools that allow you to take action through workflows and integrations. So for example, uh, if an IT department gets a negative CSAT score on a particular issue, uh, you can set up a workflow that will automatically open up that ticket, ping it to a uh, Slack channel, escalate it to management through email or Slack, and then monitor that ticket against predefined SLAs. So what's the, the uh, Qualtrics integration with Slack? Well, you hit the uh, forward slash Qualtrics command, and a modal will pop up. This will allow you to connect your account, and then you can click Send Survey. From there, you'll see all of the questionnaires that you've created in our editor. This could be anything, but a couple examples are team activity surveys, um, uh, office hour signups, uh, feature feedback, or uh, uh, even employee check-in surveys. Once you uh, specify who you want to send it to and a message, uh, you get a confirmation screen, such as this, to make sure you know what's going to happen and when. And then when you click Send, you get a notification. And here, there's a couple tips that we provide. One is um, a link over to the, uh, the workflows se section of our product which allows you to take action on the results of that survey. Um, and then also our reporting tool, where you can do some further analysis. OK, if you're a recipient, this is what you would receive. You'd receive the message, an option to take the survey right away, or to do it later. Uh, if you click Take Survey, you're going to see a modal that pops up. This is the Slack modal. And we are dynamically rendering the questionnaires that you created inside of Qualtrics through the modal. Um, we're really excited about this because one thing we, we really like and what we've been wanting to do here is to allow these recipients to have this feedback collection process uh, directly inside of Slack instead of having to send them out. Yeah, look at that multi-select. Let's give Clayton <laughs> a round of applause. 
<laughs> and last, we have Todd, Director of Product at Instructure, a learning and development software company. Hello everyone, I'm Todd. I'm excited to be here with you today to talk about what we've done in Slack. Instructure is a company that focuses on helping people grow and develop from their first day of school to the last day of work. For schools, for teachers, for students, we built Canvas and really focused on the needs that they have to elevate teaching and learning experiences. And people use Canvas in thousands of education institutions all over the world. At work, learning is a little bit different. It's less about semesters and classes, and it's more about skills. It's more about the things that we need to do well in our current roles and prepare for the future of our careers. So we're going to focus on Bridge. In Bridge, we have structured conversations between you and your manager where you identify the long-term vision you have for your career, the drivers that really matter for you in the things that are part of your work experience, and then we help you create a plan to get there. Having one-on-one -on -one check ins regularly with your manager that are focused on substance instead of just status updates. And then really infusing that um, development with learning content, which is a lot of what we think about when we think about learning. But learning is far more than just content, and so we also like to connect you with other people in the organization. One of the most interesting questions to ask that's kind of hard in a company is, who could help me with something, and Bridge seeks to solve that problem in connecting people. All of this comes together in Bridge in a career development plan, where taking that long-term vision for your career, you identify one to three skills that you want to work on right now that will help you crush it in your current role and prepare for what's next for you. With these goals, you can talk about uh, tasks that you might have or people you want to meet or content that you really want to focus on consuming and learning from. And so focusing in on that skill that you want to learn from, learn about, uh, you can pull up content that's relevant to that. Now these kinds of reflective experiences are really awesome. Uh, but a lot of the time, the things that we want to learn, the things that initiate that desire to learn, happen in the flow of work. And so we focused our Slack app on answering that question, how can I learn more about X? Uh, we were excited to be featured in the keynote earlier, and so there was a live demo of Bridge. So this will be actually a little lower fidelity than what you've already seen Bridge do. A, a user comes to the, to the app, and the App Home Open event lets us know that they've come, and we welcome them and invite them to search the library. They can type in anything they want, and we'll search our library that's been provided by your company, the content providers that they've integrated into Bridge and we'll return results that will show you what's available for you to learn, including how long will this take for me um, to do, and a little bit more about the course. When you're ready and you've picked one that you like, you can see more detail about that, and we'll reserve you a spot in that course, and you can confirm your enrollment by just clicking OK. Once you've enrolled in the course, we leave behind a way to launch that course or unenroll from that course. One of the things I'm most excited about um, today was learning about the um, app home. So things like this could also live on App Home, or maybe instead live on App Home, where they can come back, see what they're enrolled in, and unenroll from the things that they have. So we're excited for what we've built using these new services, and um, excited to talk more about it. Thank you. Great. So let's talk a little bit about building a Slack app. Um, let's start with Aleem. How did you approach building your app on Slack? Um, yeah, uh, so the interesting thi thing about, um, about Streak, this is our first Slack app. This is not just us taking advantage of the Modals API. This is our first Slack app. And um, one thing that we had heard from a lot of customers is that they wanted it. And so we just used our customers as our way of doing the product development. Um, so we just looked at what integrations they had built. And that's something that's unique to Slack is, is that customers can, our customers at least can build their own integrations. Even though we, haven't, we hadn't had one, our customers were building all these integrations themselves. And so we could just look at the things that they were building and be like, OK, I guess that's what they want because they built it themselves. And so we just sort of operationalized that. Um, so that, that was a big, um, a big win. And then the, the next thing we did is we, we prototyped everything using the block kit builder. Um, and that's really cool because you can send around links. So like, 
PMs, designers, engineers. We were just sending around links, like, what if we did this? What if we did that? And we even sent some of those links to our customers, being like, hey, what if the integration looked like this? Uh, would, that, would that work for your use case? Um, so the, the blockchain builder was pretty huge. Awesome. Did you guys have a similar process? Or how did you approach building your Slack apps? For us, we had a similar experience around uh, feedback. Um, we had um, a number of customers come to us who had some ideas that response rates, which is really big in our space, um, could potentially be better than traditional ways of sending out surveys. And so given those early indicators, we had customers even willing to pay for us to build some of these types of integrations. And so I think that's a great way of validating your approach is having your customers define it through real world use cases. Mm -hmm. so Block Kit Builder was really huge for us too. So from a prototyping standpoint, it was amazing for us to get up and running, see what it would look like, and then also sped development later on. Good to hear. Block Kit Builders also just got a new makeover. So hopefully your V2 or 3 will be even easier. Um, how did you choose which aspects of your product to bring into Slack? Um, Clayton, I feel like you're a good one to take this. Yeah, so like I mentioned before, like when we, we heard about the modal functionality um, from you guys for the first time, our first, my, our first thought was just taking the survey taking experience. Mm -hmm. um, the more we can make that easy, simple, personalized, the better the response rates are going to be and the better overall experience was. Um, as we started looking at it in more uh, detail, we realized that you know, certain parts of our platform didn't make sense to move all into Slack, like the editor and our reporting. Um, those are more like power user type tools. But there were certain um, kind of workflows inside of those tools that we could expose. And one that we didn't think about until we were really designing it was the survey distribution process, where you could see all of your questionnaires and then go through this workflow of a confirmation and the notification of that. And that seemed to work really well. Awesome. Um, Todd, did you have a similar approach where you had thought about one workflow and changed your mind? Or how did your initial thoughts change as you guys started to develop? We knew we wanted to focus on learning. But I think what changed was the detail of the experience itself. Um, using the modals, like how many steps should this be? And originally, we were had fewer steps and used update instead of push. But we found that there's a real clear sequence of the steps that make it a lot easier for a user to go back and to manage. Don't, you don't have to manage all that state of where they were, that Slack would do a lot of that for us. And so as we um, exposed it to people um, and had them try it out, there was also a need for like this confirmation step at the very end that we hadn't really imagined. But by having people be able to use it, it was easy to update and change to push a new view. Awesome. Aleem, did you have a similar experience? Yeah, I think for us, it was like important to not try to replicate our entire app inside of Slack. It was important to just capture the, the most important flows. And sort of one key thing about Streak, like I was mentioning earlier, is that like it's so ingrained in people's workflow inside of Gmail. And so we wanted to do sort of the, the same thing inside of Slack. It's like basically our core product philosophy is that we shouldn't have to convince users to go somewhere else to use us. They should be able to use Streak wherever they are. So like, that was already part of our sort of core product philosophy. So it made total sense to be inside of Slack, because that's where like, a lot of work is being done now. Great. Um, so Clayton, for some people in the audience who are just getting started, I think we have a lot of people who have just heard about modals today and App Home. Um, do you have any advice or things you wish you knew? Um, so two, two come to mind. So first, um, uh, the modal title has a character limit. We ran into this. <laughs> we have uh, the survey name is typically what's on the top of the modal, and that's defined by the user inside of our editor. And so uh, there are some character constraints there that I think, one, developers need to be aware of and, pr and properly um, control against. And that's because it's on mobile, and we, it, it's, it looks great. The, modal, the, the modals look great in mobile. So we're happy with that. But that's something the developer needs to manage. And probably the second that thing that we ran into, and it's not specifically to modals, but was just getting our development going. We're, we're behind a firewall. Mm -hmm. Our security team did not approve of using NGROC and, and opening up a port through that. And so um, we had to find a different solution. And so uh, we used uh, a site called webhook.site that, that, that worked pretty well. So if anyone's behind a firewall runs into similar issues, that's something that we use to get around that. Cool. Uh, do you have any things to share about this as well? Yeah, I, th I think um, yeah, the NGROC thing, if you can use it, it's really good. Um, it makes the development process much easier. Another just small trick is set up each developer with a different Slack app so that they can all 
um, have their own ngrok set up and have their own development set up. I think it's really important when you're developing a Slack app to have like a fast iteration cycle. And so like doing that work up front to like set that all up um, makes you go much faster later. Mm -hmm. yeah. What about you, Todd? Words of I, advice. I would say, <laughs> I mean, a lot of repeats. If you're really early getting started, things like, you know, being aware of a three, se three second time limit to respond. So responding quickly and then, and then taking action after that is something that, you know, if you're just getting started, you might not be aware of that, that you need to do that. Um, and then like, take advantage of the tools. Uh, we, I worked with a very small team, and I'm a product manager, and I ended up doing a lot of the design very easily in BlockKit Builder. Putting all that together, um, it made it way, way, way faster. So don't, don't go to design tools first. <laughs> go straight to BlockKit Builder and start there. Awesome. And then I have to ask, now that you've got the block kit PM here, um, what is your number one feature request, or what's top on your wish list? Um, yeah, I can start. Um, so given that you have block kit PM, um, <laughs> one thing that would be awesome is, um, so block kit does output the JSON that you can use um, in, in, in your app, but most, most of the serious apps aren't going to be sort of hand building that JSON, you know, through strings or whatever, you're probably going to be using some client library or rolling your own client library. Um, and so it'd be really cool if Slack had sort of official client libraries in all the different languages, and that block kit builder could just like output the client library code as opposed to the JSON. So then it's even easier for your devs because they just like copy and paste the code and they're done. Um, right now, e even though the JSON is there and it's nice, they still have to translate that into the programmatic way of, of generating that JSON. Good feedback. For me, um, I'm going to have to say with more um, block kit question types. Uh, we uh, have lots of different surveys, questions that we use, and uh, we have to have surveys that are compatible with block kit. And so that's just one kind of constraint here. So we'd love to see like a matrix type question, very common in research and NPS and, and CSATs and things like that. So we'd love to see that be added. That's cool. Yeah, we really focused on, we've, we have focused on sending messages for like status updates and now interactivity. One of the areas that we haven't explored yet is kind of having a true conversational type bot. So I think more support around scaffolding that would be really, really amazing for, for developers to get more conversational apps. Awesome. Well, that concludes my questions, because I'm going to start talking about the roadmap. But uh, first, I want to give you all a big congrats for launching your three apps. And thank you for failing forward with us and building on Modals at its awesome. earliest stage. Um, can we get a round of applause for our partners here? Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thanks. So I think these gentlemen will be around today and tomorrow if you have questions. Feel free to grab them. Or we also have demos of all three of their apps at the Block Kit booth, which is right outside. And myself and a number of my teammates, who are right there as well, will probably be there. Um, but first, let's chat about the roadmap. Um, we're just wrapping up, talking about some new blocks. Uh, at Frontiers in April, we heard your feedback. We had a voting wall. We did a lot of developer surveys. And we heard lots of requests. But the top ones were block kit and modals, block kit multi-selects, multi-step modals, dynamically updating modals. Is this starting to sound familiar? Uh, but we also heard radio buttons and checkboxes. So I'm here today to confirm what you heard in the keynote this morning, that radio buttons are now live in the block kit and app home space and will be generally available later this year. And our team is also actively working on bringing checkboxes to BlockKit as well. Other things that we're thinking about with BlockKit is how it can work best in the app home space. As we've been talking about, that's a completely new surface area. And so there's totally different workflows that need to be enabled there. And so I would love to make sure that we're enabling you to have more control over layout and padding and styling, like an H1 or an H2. Uh, these are a lot of things we hear with modals, and I'm pretty sure we're going to hear very similar requests from App Home. But I don't know for sure, so I would love to chat with you more today or tomorrow. I will be around the conference and at every, every session that has to do with BlockKit. Uh, but another thing I wanted to talk about first is the BlockKit Builder. You saw a demo of it this morning. We've done a full new redesign of BlockKit Builder 
to make it more usable for you. It has better information architecture, simpler control of the preview. It also supports app home, modals, and messages. So you can continue that prototyping experience that we've heard from many people is incredibly useful with all of those surface areas. The last thing to do is get started building a Slack app. We recommend starting by hitting up our documentation and checking out the Block Kit Hub. This is a newly minted hub that goes through all of the Block Kit components, which surface areas they work in, how they function, how our validation works for input blocks, and then start prototyping once you feel comfortable with the components. Head on over to the builder and prototype there. And then once you're ready to start building, opt into the just opened up App Home open beta at the App Home page of our API site. Uh, and that's where you can opt into the App Home tab, understand that the endpoint that we've launched with that space, and start building as soon as possible. That's all I have today. Uh, I just want to thank you so much for coming out to our second annual spec conference. It's an exciting time for Slack. Uh, I really look forward to chatting with a lot of you and seeing the awesome apps you're building with BlockKit. Thank you.